uh, God bless you, brother. Preach to us. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And yes, uh, we've enjoyed getting to know the Ludkas. Met them um, back in February. And as he said, it was just an immediate, many things in common. And my wife, Dawn, really hated she could not come. Hopefully on a... S- what did you make a mistake You're not on? not preaching today, sir. No, I'm, just I'm not preaching today. Okay. <laughs> God bless y'all. Kids, dismiss the super church if you're still in here. Sorry. Oh, can I go to super church? But yeah, it was just an enjoyable time. Briefly, we got to meet with them and um, then worked out that we were able to come up here and share our ministry. And I I love uh, John and Bonnie and Mike's and the other pastors' uh, perspective on ministry and how they're leading you through true gospel community in the body of Christ. I just love that and really, really admire the way that you guys are doing life together as a body of of Christ. And so it's been very, very encouraging to me. Give you a little bit of background on us. Uh, No, I'm not from around here. You can probably tell by the way I talk, but I do have a friend. Is it Ben? Who's from South Carolina? There he is. South Carolina, right? (laughs) Ben back there, and another Georgia guy I met this morning. Uh, cannot rem- there he is. All right. So we're not alone, men. We're, we're together. Um, I don't think I have that much of an accent, but I was born and raised in North Carolina. Now we're serving in South Carolina in Columbia uh, with our ministry. But we started out in education. My wife and I graduated from Pensacola, spent 10 years in Christian education, coaching basketball, and loved that ministry, working with teenagers and Uh, spurring them on to surrender to the Lord and what he would have for their lives. Uh, But then the Lord worked on our heart and led us to go into missions. And I gave all the excuses, you know, we're 32 years old, I got four kids, what in the world, this is not God talking. But it was. And so he led us to, um, to the mission field, studied Spanish in Costa Rica, then spent the next eight years in Cuba, in the Dominican Republic, and in Uh, Charleston, South Carolina, planting Hispanic churches. While we were in Cuba, uh, the Lord allowed my wife to be diagnosed with lupus. And so that was a whole complex journey there that I'll speak about a little bit later on. But through that, biblical counseling came across our path and really uh, changed the direction of our lives and impacted us. And so uh, we transitioned back to South Carolina in Charleston. She got medical treatment, and now she's in remission, thank the Lord. So um, when we were going through the transition of leadership in the Hispanic church in Charleston, South Carolina, to the new pastor, we were thinking about next steps. What do you want us to do next, God? And we began to pray, is there a way that we can take the heart of a pastor and combine it with helping those in the ministry. Um, And he led us to start Sela International Counseling Ministries. And our focus is coming alongside pastors, their wives, their kids, missionaries, their wives, their kids, Christian school teachers, their wives, their kids, anybody that is in serving in full-time ministry, come alongside them and walk through their need with them. When you guys have an issue, a problem, a disappointment, a trial, who do you go to? Your pastors, right? When your pastor has a difficulty, struggle, or trial, who does he go to? God. But we also have the body of Christ. So that is our heart. I can show a video. Hopefully the video will give you a very, very clear uh, picture of what it is that we do, what we're about, and the scope of our ministry. We've got a, a blank screen that's just beautiful back there. There we go. When we launched Sela International Counseling Ministries in December of 2020, we anticipated great things to eventually come. But our God is doing exceeding abundantly above all we could have ever imagined. We hope this presentation informs you of our priorities as a ministry encourages you with some of the amazing things God has already done and inspires you to join us in what God has next for Selah and for those we seek to serve. There is a desperate, glaring need for Selah 
and more Bible-centered ministries just like it. The Sela story is a personal one. This ministry was born because Dawn and I experienced the positive impact of biblical counseling in our marriage and in our family while serving the Lord in global missions. We were seeking to serve with faithfulness, but we were struggling beyond our own capacities to find strength and embrace God's truth. We needed help, and we found it through biblical counseling. We get it. We've experienced the heaviness, the darkness, the powerlessness, the fear, and the questioning. But it's because we also experienced the freedom, the hope, and the help we needed that we founded Sela International. And while we worked so hard to ensure Sela's personalized focus remains laser sharp and crystal clear. In complete <coughs> dependence upon God's grace, Sela International serves God's church and His servants by helping them remain faithful, healthy, and whole as they continue to serve the Lord. We never imagined God would use the ministry of Sela to impact so many so soon, but we give Him all the glory and thank so many who have sacrificially partnered and served with us. 2021 was such an encouraging start when we first felt the burden to address the need. 2022 validated the need as even more ministry families reached out for help, but 2023 was remarkable. As a result, we are squeezing ministry to God's servants into every possible moment of time. Now this is exciting to begin to think about what could be done in the years ahead. And not only this, but God gifted us a home base for Selah, a solid foundation for a bright future. Through the intentional application of His Word, God has restored families, healed marriages, given hope to the depressed, and to those who've been sinned against. He's also restored courage to those who have suffered great loss. We've received so many testimonies of praise to the Lord from individuals and couples who have returned to their homes and ministries strengthened and helped. God is enabling us to accomplish this mission in three ways. First, personal counseling and care for ministry leaders. We provide bilingual, in-person, and global virtual counseling for those in the ministry. When there are deeper issues, such as grief, depression, family conflict, or marital crises, we can provide several days of intensive counseling and respite on our beautiful property. Second, missionary debriefing and soul care. Sela can serve an entire missionary family who's lived and served cross-culturally for years. We help each member of the family biblically debrief as they process their experiences from the foreign mission field and then reacclimate to American culture. Third, retreats and refreshment. Located near Columbia, South Carolina, our 48-acre property includes renovated private lodging accommodations, which allows us to serve multiple ministry families at the same time. And as if the facilities were not blessing enough, there's a seven-acre lake that provides endless possibilities for outdoor activity. Looking ahead, we see this multifaceted property allowing us to host pastoral staff retreats and workshops for ministry leaders to provide them a time of spiritual renewal and rest. We truly can't wait to see what God has for us next. A ministry such as Sela cannot exist to make an eternal impact apart from dependence on God and God's people as we seek to serve those in need. So allow me to highlight a few ways Sela can serve you, your church, and those sent out from your church. Pastors and ministry leaders, Sela is beneficial to you and your family. If you're hurting or perplexed, you don't have to keep struggling alone. Please reach out to us at selahinternational.org. As it says in Hebrews 12, we would love to help lift up the hands which hang down and strengthen the feeble knees. Church members, introduce Selah to your pastor, pastoral staff, and missionaries. Send them to our annual refresh retreat, or even send them to our property for a personal time of renewal, and encourage them to reach out in times of need. Congregations, 
We'd love to assist you as you seek to care for your missionaries. Our Soul Care Initiative is a great way for you to actively meet their needs in a tangible way through partnership with Sela International. Partnering together will allow us to provide needed counseling and support to these heroes of the faith as they carry on the work of the gospel on the mission field. Now, here's how you and your church can help Sela. We need passionate individuals and churches at the grassroots level to come alongside and partner with us financially and in fervent prayer. Would you pray about taking an active part in helping Sela International continue to be that safe haven for God's servants and their families? Your generous one-time or monthly gift allows Sela International to sustain and continue to grow to meet the increasing demands of coming alongside so many ministry leaders in their time of need. So we praise God for all He's allowed us to experience thus far at Sela. And we want to ask you to join us in continued prayer and greater partnership as together we serve God's family and look to God's leading for the next chapter on this blessed journey. From the Selah family to your hearts, we thank God upon every remembrance of you. And we thank you for this opportunity to share what God is doing. This is why we exist, brothers and sisters, uh, to come alongside your pastors and missionaries to keep them in their place of service. But we just don't need them filling the spot. We need them to be strong and encouraged so that they can be there for you in your time of need. It's very difficult to help someone else when you are going through the throes of um, a, tr a deep, deep, deep trial or a crisis or depression. So if you don't mind, would you please pray for Sail International and if the Lord leads, um, maybe community could partner with us as we try to impact um, the gospel and eternity as we minister around the world. Um, a few things on the table that Pastor Ludka mentioned. I just want to draw them to your attention very, very quickly. First of all is our um, contact card, which is a very, very difficult to find sometimes because it is so small. But it's a little business card that you'll enjoy. About this size, back there on the table, has all our contact information on it. So get, grab one of those and you will uh, be able to get in touch with any questions or anything at all that you need. We exist to serve the body of Christ. Also, these are our updates. The best way to keep in touch with what we're doing is sign up with your email address. By the way, sign it legibly. We get these all the time. We have no idea, so you will never get an update if we don't know how to read your email. So take a copy of this and then sign up. And we also have announcements and uh, articles, blogs that we send out to encourage you um, in your journey. There are also small counseling booklets that deal with different topics. Well, this is depression. Um, this is one on ultimate questions for evangelism. There's someone you know that is actively questioning and interested in knowing more about the gospel. This is the book to give them. It goes through every, about every single question that an unbeliever would have and leads them to the cross and to the gospel. So there it is. <laughs> this is the card. Even got our picture on the back. So grab one of these. They're five bucks each, which just covers the cost and shipping of those. Um, and I believe they will encourage you. Last thing we have on the, the table is one of the most popular things we um, have as we carry ar go around. These are, these are prayer cards for your pastor and for his wife and his family and for your missionaries on the back. What this is, there are specific prayers that you can pray for your pastor and these are gathered from our family and other pastors around the world that um, say, if I wanted my people to pray about something, this would be it. First one says, pray that your pastor will pursue an intimate love relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what we need, right? Guess what? Your pastor needs that too. So I think these are effective. There are also tangible ways you can show him that you love him. Um, pastor added two or three here that you could focus on, like um, steakhouse, gift card. <laughs> Am I right, Pastor? Bonnie's saying yes. Pastor's embarrassed right now. 
Seriously, take two or three of these. Put them around your house. Pray as a family. Put them in your Bible. And that way, I believe it truly will enhance your prayer life as you pray for your spiritual leaders. Take your Bibles. Turn to Psalm 46. Oh, no. How many have said that in the last two weeks? Oh, no. Your car messes up, the mechanic calls, and you need a new transmission. I love this one. Oh, no. Your daughter finally passed her driver's test. Oh, no. Your wife says, honey, we need to talk. I don't know about you, man, but that anxiety arises because I have no idea what I did. Then on a serious note, you get the call uh, that you've been diagnosed with stage four cancer. Or a family member is in a difficult car wreck or a heart attack or stroke or some other type of crisis. All of us face those oh no moments constantly. Maybe you're facing one right now. What do you do? What do you do when your neighbor who doesn't know the Lord comes to you and says, I'm so sorry about that, but I thought you were a Christian. Why would God let this happen to you? How would you answer that? Maybe you're even thinking that. We all go through these crisis moments, but when we go through those as a believer, we must have a solid foundation that we're able to use to face those crisis moments. Psalm 46 is one of the best tools that God has given us in Scripture to be able to walk through a crisis with great confidence. It's one of the greatest confidence-producing psalms in all of Scripture. So this morning, I'd like us to dive deep into this psalm, the historical background, and make application to our lives right now. Can we do that? Are you with me? Can we pray and ask for the Lord's help? Father, this moment where we only have 30 minutes, 30 minutes left. So God, I pray that you would use just this half hour to impact someone for eternity. Lord, if there's someone here that, that really has no idea what it means to be saved or to have a personal, intimate love relationship with Christ, Lord, may something that's said pique their interest. Lord, I pray that you would draw them to yourself. I pray also for those that are here that are going through a crisis, Lord, that we would be able to um, draw on your word and then be able to see clearly, Lord, what you're having us to do and calling us to do in this moment. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. The great reformer Martin Luther uh, when he was in great distress, he would gather the congregation together and he would say, um, let's sing the 46th Psalm and then let the devil do his worst. I have not said that. I'm not to the level of my spiritual walk with the Lord, I can say that. But I can tell you what, there's something about this Psalm that produces confidence in us. Um, this psalm was written, obviously, when there was a, an extreme struggle to survive. The author of the psalm uh, gives us the context that is pleading to God to deliver Israel in the face of an overwhelming enemy. Most commentators believe this psalm was written around 701 BC when King Sennacherib was descending upon Israel and then eventually on Jerusalem to annihilate the Jews. Um, there was a very, very ruthless army, and to this point, when this psalm was written, already 42 cities across the land of Judah had already been conquered, and 200,000 Israelites had been taken captive, and, and Jerusalem knew about that. King Hezekiah was the king at that time in Jerusalem, and Isaiah was the prophet, and they were both in Jerusalem during this attack. The Assyrians would use what we call a siege. Anybody heard of that before? Siege warfare, where you surround a city and you will wait until they just cannot go another step and they have to surrender. You've cut off all supplies and it's just a matter of time. Well, that's what King Sennacherib was doing right here. 
Um, there are three accounts of this attack in the Old Testament. Kings, Chronicles, and here in Isaiah. I want to focus on what happened in Isaiah. So if you don't mind, if you would just jot in the margin of Psalm 46, Isaiah 37. That's where we have the account of what is going on when Psalm 46 was written. Part of the siege strategy was to demoralize the enemy. So they would write letters. King Sennacherib did this. He wrote a letter to Hezekiah in order to demoralize him. We see what he said in those letters in verses 10 and 11. Now, I'm not going to read the exact words other than the introduction of verses 10 and 11. Um, Sennacherib said this to King Hezekiah through a letter. He said, Thus shall ye speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, deceive thee. Now I'm going to say it in 2024 language that you, young people, everyone, you hear this spoken from the current world system. This is in essence what he was saying. Stop believing all the nonsense about God being Yahweh. Stop believing that you're a special city called out by and chosen by God. Stop believing that this phantom God is somehow going to deliver you. Look at all these other cities that have been destroyed. Are you special? Is anything going to be different with you? No. Make the decision now to surrender because destruction is imminent. Have you gotten that message from the world? Believing in who? God? Hezekiah received that letter. Part of it was true. Other cities had been destroyed. Nothing was happening. There was no hope. So what did he do? You remember what he did? He took the letters and he put them on the floor. And he got down on his face before the Lord. And he wept and he cried out to God. Have you been there lately? No idea what to do next. It's not a bad place to be. Because that night, God answered And he sent back the answer to Hezekiah's prayer. And he said in verses 33 through 35. Now remember, he didn't send this to to Hezekiah. He sent it to Isaiah, who was the prophet. God spoke to the prophets. Then Isaiah transferred the message to the king. And this was his response in verses 33 through 35. This is verbatim from the scriptures. It says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into the city. Nor shall he shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. By the way he came, the same shall he return and shall not come into the city. God said it twice. He ain't coming in the city. Well, we say ain't down in South Carolina. He ain't coming into this city. Listen to me. He's not coming. You're not going to be destroyed. Then he says, I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Based on the wording of Psalm 46, I actually believe, along with some other commentators, that it was Isaiah who penned this psalm. David was dead. He had been dead for a long time. So Isaiah received it, got God's word, sent it to Hezekiah, and then he was thinking, man, i gotta, I got to write this down. And so he wrote it down. There are three stanzas of the song, and after each stanza, there's a little word I love. What's the word? It's Selah. Selah is a musical term. Most of you all know the first meaning of Selah. It means to pause and to stop. During that pause, when they were singing the psalms, they were all songs, by the way, when they were singing the psalms, they would stop every time they came to Selah, pause, then they would reflect on what they had just sung. They would think about it. Sometimes it would be complete silence among those thousands of people. Sometimes the musicians would retune their instruments. Sometimes they would sing it again a cappella. But no matter what, they would continue going over that truth and not just go past it. Then before they went to the next stanza, they would praise him and thank God for the truth. Now you know why some of the services lasted five or six hours. 
They took their time going through Scripture. So, let's read Psalm 46, and we're going to read it similar to that method, okay? Could you all read it with me in voz alta? I'm speaking in Spanish. I'm so sorry. <laughs> read it out loud, okay? Thank you. Verse 1, everyone together. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah. Hmm. A lot bad going on there, right? Mountains being earthquakes, storms, yet we're not going to fear. Wow. Think about that. Verse 4, together, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved, God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Hmm. Verse 8. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. We could just probably leave right now and be encouraged, right? Just from reading the scripture. There's just three truths I want to draw out this morning that I hope will be a, an encouragement to you. The first thing I see in this psalm is that we can have confidence in the midst of a great crisis because of God's presence. Verse number one says, God is our refuge and strength, a very what? A present help in trouble. Jerusalem was surrounded completely. Fear was gripping the heart of King Hezekiah and everybody inside those walls. But now they had been given the, pre the promise of God. If you're in a crisis right now, if you're hurting, there is no truth that is more powerful and more comforting if you're going through physical suffering or if you're going through emotional suffering. The truth that God is with you Preserve your hope in the Lord during that time. If you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, you can say that with confidence. If you're here this morning and you are not sure that you have been saved, and you're wondering what that is all about, you can't say that. You can't have that confidence. But the minute you place your faith in Christ, you have all the confidence in the world that God is is with you. So if somebody comes up to you and they say, I thought you were a Christian, why would God let this happen to you? Or if you're thinking that, this is what you can say. You know what, friend? I don't know. I don't know why I'm going through this. But I do know this. I don't have to go through it alone. Because God's promised his presence with me. And not only that, before the foundation of the world, God knew I was going to be going through this. And he's given me everything I need to go through this with my confidence in him. Do you have that confidence? If you just think that, that will encourage your heart, brothers and sisters. What does Psalm 23, 4 say? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? because thou art with me. Isaiah 43, when thou passest through the waters, when you pass through the rivers, when you pass through the fire, it will not touch you. Why? 
I will be with thee. Then back to verse 2 in Psalm 46. It says, therefore will not we fear. Okay, you with me here? So if he says we won't fear because God's a very present help in trouble, then fear is irrational. Can you repeat that, please? No, repeat it like you believe it. <laughs> well, you don't believe that. I know what God says, but you don't know what I'm going through. No, fear is irrational if you believe that the holy God, sovereign of the universe, is with you. No matter how bad we feel, we can't succumb to distrusting God. We will feel the anxiety. Yeah, it's... There's going to be righteous concern about many things in our life. That anxiety will start, but you can't cure that anxiety. So don't get anxious because you have anxiety. We'll talk about that this afternoon. But that anxiety, you can't just stop that because it's an emotion. You can't stop being sad. Stop it. Stop being happy. No, stop it. Because it's an emotion. But where does that anxiety come from? It comes from fear, sinful fear in our life. So if you deal with a the fear, then you can manage that anxiety because you're trusting God. So crisis happens. Selah. Pause, reflect, praise. And then go forward in confidence. When you face an oh no moment, do not. Jump up and just react harshly. If you start playing your instrument harshly, you're going to distort the life song that God is wanting you to play and sing. So take a moment, Selah, and then once you're with the Lord, you're reflecting on His Word, you're praising Him for that Word, you believe it, then you go forward in confidence. Because of God's presence, we have confidence. Number two, because of God's provision, we can have confidence. One of the greatest fears during a siege was that the water supply would be cut off. When that happened, you're done. And so the psalmist speaks directly to this fear in verse 4. He says, there's a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved or shaken. God shall help her, and that right early. Unknown to King Sennacherib, King Hezekiah, a few years before the attack, had dug a tunnel called Hezekiah's Tunnel. This is it right here in Israel. That tunnel connected from the brook Gihon outside the city walls of Jerusalem and went underground and emptied out into the pool of Siloam right in the middle of the city of Jerusalem. So they had a fresh supply of water. My wife and I got to go last June to see Israel. Our Hispanic church gifted us a trip there. And we actually walked over the brook Gihon. This is it right here. And it sounds really loud. There you go. Do you hear that? We couldn't hardly hear ourselves think it was so loud. That's the same place where they tapped into hundreds of years ago during this story. Hezekiah's tunnel. Brothers and sisters, does that remind you of anything? What do we have inside of us? He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's the Holy Spirit of God. That's that hidden resource that provides us what we need in those moments of crisis. No matter what's happening, he is there. We just don't draw on him. Corey Ten Boom. Have you heard of her? Anybody suffered like her that's here this morning? Probably not. They were hiding Jews. She wasn't a Jew, but they hid Jews. And they found out they were hiding Jews, and they went to the concentration camp. She saw her sister starved to death. Her father and mother were killed. And she suffered great persecution. Then, when she was suffering that persecution, um, she admitted that she hated those Nazis. She wanted to see them dead. But then she remembered when she was a little girl the fear that she experienced when she saw an 18-year-old cousin die right in front of her. And as a 10-year-old girl, she just could not get over that. 
And she talked to her dad about it. Nothing helped. So finally, one day, he took her on a walk. And he said, Corey, when do I give you the ticket to get on the train when we ride that? And she said, well, Dad, when I get on the train. He said, whatever God allows in your life, even death, then when you get to that point, God is going to give you the ticket of his grace to ride that train. Do you think Corey got her ticket? Because she was able to forgive. Read the hiding place. Read testimonies of her life. Unbelievable. And by the way, the actress that portrayed Corey in the movie, The Hiding Place, was interviewed. And they asked her, what was the most outstanding characteristic of Corey as you were working with her and learning about her life? The actress said, no doubt. The most outstanding characteristic of Corey Ten Boom was joy. Think about that. All she has been through, joy. Grace through the power of the Holy Spirit is what can provide that for you during this crisis moment. The Bible doesn't promise that we're going to be immune from suffering, brothers and sisters. So we know that, but we sort of think that, and we're surprised when we go through crises. What he does promise is that God will be strong for us, as we read in this psalm, but he is also going to be strong in us through the power of of the Holy Spirit. So if you're going through that struggle right now, remember that the struggle will not get better without Jesus. In fact, it gets better with more of Jesus, not less of Jesus. So if you're doubting God, if you're wondering why you're going through this deep crisis, the worst thing you can do is pull away from the Lord. Don't stop coming to church. Stop reading the Bible. Keep reading the Bible more. Get around your brothers and sisters in Christ. He will provide what you need to face this crisis with confidence. So we have confidence because of God's presence, his provision, and lastly, because of his purpose. Because of his purpose. This is my favorite. Verse 8 says, Come behold. Are you still with me there in Psalm 46? I want you to see the scriptures. Come behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease. He, unto the end of the earth, he breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder, and he burneth the chariot in the fire. What Isaiah was doing there, he was recounting all of the wonders and miracles God had done in the past. The Red Sea, when he destroyed the Egyptian army. Um, the other miracles of, of crossing the Red Sea, of these armies that would come against the Israelites with Gideon, 300 against thousands, and God got the victory. So he was reminding himself of that. And proud Sennacherib didn't reckon with the, with the fact that he was dealing with Yahweh himself, a holy God. And he mocked him. But God will not be mocked, brothers and sisters. All of these voices that are calling out today, mocking truth and scripture and twisting truth, God is not mocked. He will make things right one day. Completely. Because he's a just God. But when Hezekiah prayed that night... God sent the answer, and then after that, the angel of the Lord came down and struck 185,000 soldiers just like that, and they all died. And just like he had said, King Sennacherib turned tail and ran. And he did not come into the city. God spared that. And now we come to the verse. All of you know, Psalm 46.10. This verse reveals to us God's supreme purpose in every single trial he allows in your life, no matter what it is. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen and I will be exalted in the earth. That's God's purpose, my brothers and sisters. God to be magnified and exalted among those that don't know him. In this verse, God himself is speaking and this verse is not in the first place a comfort when we're just stressed out. Okay? Though it is, typically we see this verse posted on Instagram and Facebook with a coffee mug and a Bible laying there so everybody knows we had our devotions that morning. I'm not judging. But, and yeah, it's good if you're stressed. This is great. But it's not the tone of the verse in Hebrew. The tone of the verse is like you have a five-year-old kid and he will not sit down and be still. 
So what do you do? Jeff, sit down. Be still. No, Jeff, Jeff, look at me. Jeff, look at me. Be still. How many have a kid like that? How many have a husband like that? Yeah. That's the tone of the verse. It's like, no, stop. Literally, it means lay down your arms and stop fighting against my plan for your life. Surrender. Okay, God, I've prayed for this to change, but it ain't changing. Okay, I surrender to your plan for my life. Psalm 4610 is actually a rebuke to a turbulent and restless heart. Sea of Galilee, Jesus, peace, be still. All the waves, whew. That's what happens in our heart during a crisis. When we go through difficult times, we can respond in anger. Or another way of saying that is we freak out. How many are sitting beside someone who freaks out? Brother, you have done an amazing job in this church. How many would admit, how many would admit, okay, I'm a freaker outer, a crisis happens, I just lose it. Thanks for, for your honesty, thank you. How many would admit, I don't, I, I pitch a pity party whenever that happens. I pout and I just, whenever there's a crisis. Anybody? My hands are lifted, that's who I am, I'm a pity partier. Which one of those honors God? The pity partier, amen, no. <laughs> you know, we withdraw and don't get mad and we don't say ugly things, you know? So we're more holy. No, neither one honors the Lord. God has said, when you are going through a crisis, you must remember that your heart, your mind, your soul must be brought into alignment with God's perfect plan for your life. You've got to surrender to that. Now, there's a time when you're going through a crisis that is just so excruciating and painful and raw, God is not going to grab you and say, stop it, sit still. He's not going to do that. During those moments, you know what he's going to do? He's going to draw you close. He's going to embrace you. He's going to walk with you through that, through the body of Christ, through his word through your interaction with the Lord and the Holy Spirit. He's going to let you grieve and go through that. But there comes a time that we choose to stay there and we don't allow the comfort He has provided for us to go deep into our heart. And we must express that trust in Him. God says, be still. Stop questioning me. Stop the pity party. I am with you. I will provide what you need and I will complete my purpose in your life. I will be exalted through this crisis. Trust me, glorify me. If you're in the middle of a crisis, there's a couple of points. Um, the, biblical, the, the power of biblical counseling, at least in our lives, was the steps. It was the truth, but then, okay, here's how you apply the truth. Step one, step two, step three. Not a formula, but in a crisis when you can't even think, you need those steps, okay? First of all, first step, trust his promises. Now, how are you going to trust his promises if you don't know his promises? You've got to get in his word. He promises his presence, just in this passage, his presence, his purpose, and his provision. Trust him. Crisis happens. Trust him, Selah. Trust him, Selah. Pause, reflect, praise. Um, one of the best definitions I've ever come across from trust, I heard from our mentor, Ron Alchin, who is a great biblical counselor, started two counseling centers. Um, this is the best one. So if you're taking notes or if you're not taking notes, take this note, okay? Trust is this. Trust is believing the word of God, then acting upon it, no matter how you feel, knowing that God promises a good result. We're led by feelings, right? Gen Zers, millennials, what generation are we, brother? The greatest generation, right? I can't remember what we are. Baby boomers, that's what, no? Whatever we are. 
anyway, more and more, the focus is on ourselves and on feelings. Expressive individualism, that is that. It is what governs me and what directs my thoughts and my actions are how I feel about myself. That's the opposite of trust. Trust is believing what God said, not how I feel. And then acting upon what God has said, knowing that eventually he's going to bring a good result. And I will be glad that I have done that. Like many of you, we faced a crisis. I mentioned about the Dominican. Um, when we faced the crisis about Dawn's diagnosis, it, it, was, it was a blow because we had spent all kinds of effort and money and everything to get to the mission field. We couldn't imagine that God would be doing this. And so we, we thought, well, God's going to heal her for sure. So we just kept on going. Ministry had to go on, right? So we kept on going, but he didn't heal her. And it went on and on and on and on. And so we were faced with the fact that, wow, maybe we have to come off the field, but no. So we didn't tell anybody about it. Who were we going to tell? Her father-in-law was our sending pastor. And around that, there was depression involved. There was marital issues involved. There was um, lack of leadership on my part, delaying to make the decision. Why? Well, I was trusting God, yeah, but also I was so scared what people would think. If a missionary comes off the field, that is the worst. You're a failure. You couldn't hack it. At least what we, we thought that's what people would think. By God's grace, a friend of ours came down to the Dominican. We hadn't told anybody, but he saw things weren't right. And he said, Chris, what's going on? I told him. I told him. I was transparent. And um, he said, okay, I've got a couple that I know they're biblical counselors. Can I call them? He called them. Within one week, they flew down to the Dominican Republic. They paid for their whole trip. And they spent a week with us, speaking truth to two pastor's kids that knew Scripture from the, from the time before they were born. And we knew the Scripture, but we weren't applying it. And the gap between what you preach and how you live, if that gets wider and wider and wider, there will be a fall, brothers and sisters. If you're a believer or if you're a ministry leader, it will happen. But I thank God that they intervened. They spoke truth to us. It wasn't easy. It required a lot of humility to receive that. But then they gave us the steps. We transitioned off the field, and by God's grace, he allowed us to plant another Hispanic church in Charleston. Oh, and listen to this. By God's grace, all of our kids are in ministry. Go figure that one. It doesn't make sense, but they are. Two years ago, we had another crisis. Um, my daughter-in-law, Tony, she was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and she was 27 weeks pregnant at the time. Within, once they did, saw the brain tumor, three weeks, she was in the operating room, two 12-hour surgeries. At the end of the second surgery in recovery, she had a 100% placental abruption. The placenta tore away from the uterus wall. And within four min seven minutes, he would bleed out, our little grandson. Somehow they made it up four flights of stairs, hooked him up to the machines, and saved his life. This is them today. Tony is better than she is, has ever been before. If you follow us on Instagram and Facebook, by the way, do that. She's the one that does all the graphics. They're beautiful. Just unbelievable. And James, one of the happiest babies we've ever seen. Now, it doesn't always turn out like that. About two months ago, our youngest daughter had a miscarriage. Twelve weeks along. We never faced that before. That's hard. It's hard. But I can tell you this. There is no way to get through something like this or worse without the Holy Spirit's provision and without the Scriptures, without the Word of God. And you reflecting on the Word of God. For example, something that helped us during that time, we did this. We took this truth, we put it on a card, and we would rehearse it to ourselves over and over during that crisis. Since God is love and is so great, I live beyond harm in His hands. There's nothing that can happen to me that will not turn out for my good. Nothing. Because of this, 
that will keep him in perfect peace. Perfect peace is shalom, shalom. Not just peace, but shalom, shalom. Study that out. Whose mind is what? Stayed on thee. Because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And this is what you need to do if you're going through a crisis. You've got to put the word of God before you. Put it on a card. Read it 10 times a day. Read it for 30 days straight. You can't tell me that that's not going to help you diminish the anxiety and manage it and put your hope and trust in the Lord. When that first happened, I remember receiving the news 4.30 in the afternoon on a Saturday and I had to preach on a Sunday morning. I didn't know how I was going to do that. Preached, got in a car, we were driving three hours to be with them. And for the first time in my life, I had a panic attack. You ever had one? You feel it rising, the chest gets tight, you can't breathe, you're suffocating, thinking about all the what ifs, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if. Then I said, wait a second, I just preached on this. <laughs> Got to do what I just preached on. I preached on Habakkuk 3. 17 through 19, where Habakkuk said, though the worst case scenario happens, no food, no herd in the stalls, none of this happening, yet will I rejoice in the God of my salvation. I will rejoice in the Lord. Okay. I, re I reflected on it. I paused and I reflected on it, but nothing happened. Until I praised God for that truth. Until I said, okay, I believe it. Whew. Just went away. Now, I had to do it again in two hours. And then again, and then every day for the next 30 days. But that's how we manage anxiety. You can't cure it. You manage it by trusting the Lord and by keeping his word in front of you. Believing the word of God and acting upon it, no matter how I feel, believing that he will give a good result. Second action step is follow his commands. This is the hard part. You don't feel like it. You don't feel like following his commands. But as I am trusting, I have the responsibility to continue to fulfill what I have to do in life. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a pastor. I am whatever. So you have to just follow his commands, even though you might be numb, even though you might have very, very little joy, you must follow his commands. Remember, your feelings are followers. You don't follow your feelings. Feelings will follow what you think about what you set your mind on so therefore we must set our mind on truth like we just talked about as you're going through that obey faithfully things that you know to do do james 1 says be doers of the word and not just hearers every sunday you should take away from the sermon okay this is what god is calling me to do this week and write it down and then do it number two pray fervently when you're hurting, pray fervently. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Be careful for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by what? You know that? Prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto the Lord. And the God of peace shall guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Praying fervently means you replace fear with prayer. Whenever you're fearing, take it to the Lord in prayer and combine that with scripture next one love selflessly now, this is probably the hardest one when you're hurting to focus on others and love them but first john 4 18 says perfect love does what it casts out fear so love selflessly and then brothers and sisters get help willingly don't suffer don't try to go it alone don't be isolated Colossians 3.16 says that we're to admonish one another. The word admonish is the Greek word nutheos. It's where we get nuthetic, biblical counseling. Now, how do you do that? You're noticing your brothers and sisters. Something's not right there, like they did for me. Something's not right. So you approach, hey, are you doing okay? Yeah, I'm doing great. Praise the Lord. No, 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 no. I know you. Come over here. Tell me what's going on and then it's going to flow 
And then admonish means you encourage, you confront. That's needed sometimes. But you're there with them, doing life with them. But how are they going to know if you don't tell them? Get help willingly. Johnny Erickson Tata, paraplegic for over 50 years. You've heard of her, correct? I heard an interview one time for, from her, and she said on the interview, my handicap has been an advantage. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't hear that right. She said, yeah, it's been an advantage because my handicap has forced me to the arms of Christ. It gets better with more not less of Jesus. You can be assured that your crisis can be an advantage for you right now because in his presence, you'll find his provision and he will accomplish his purpose, whatever he allows in your life, my beloved believer. Let Psalm 46 be an anchor for you. And if you don't know the Lord is your savior, start today. He can be that for you. And he will be honored and glorified in your life. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word, for the time we've had together. I pray, Lord, that it has helped, encouraged, and convicted.